centuries earlier, when the Romans invaded Britain in AD 43. Bodium was special because it was situated on the River Rother, which in those days was wide enough for ships to sail all the way up from the sea just 10 miles away. Even the river itself followed a different course as Roman ships came to trade for Sussex iron. There was probably a Roman settlement here with a harbor and wharves where ships could tie up. The Roman road from Hastings to Rochester crossed here too. 300 years later, the Romans had left and it's the turn of a new wave of settlers, the Anglo-Saxons. It's from these people that Bodium may first have got its name, Boda's Harp, meaning Boda's village, named, perhaps, after an Anglo-Saxon chieftain. Centuries roll by. The Norman conquest is history. Ten English kings have come and gone, and Edward III sits on the throne. And somewhere around the year 1350, a very important woman enters the story. Her name is Elizabeth Wardedieu. She's from a wealthy family that owns considerable lands in the area, and she stands in line to inherit the manor of Bodium. Which may be one of the reasons why a certain knight named Sir Edward Dalingridge, back home for a short break from fighting in France in 1364, married her. He's done very well for himself as one of the followers of Sir Robert Nollies, a man so notorious that French peasants were said to jump in the river at just the mention of his name. Edward is soon back off to France, where he spends a large part of the next 10 years. But in 1377, he returns home, wealthy, powerful, and influential. To cap it all, in the same year, Elizabeth comes into her inheritance, making Sir Edward master of Bodium and all its lands. There is, however, still no peace with France, and the French are getting bolder. In 1377, they cross the channel to burn the coastal towns of Hastings and Rye, only a few miles from Bodium. Dalingridge is appointed by the new king, Richard II, to prepare the defences of Sussex against the French invasion that everyone believes will come. Not long after, the French raid the port of Winchelsea. And the river Rother is still wide enough for them to sail their ships as far as Bodium itself. As if that isn't enough, there is trouble in England itself. The peasants revolt, threatening the whole basis of feudal society. No surprise then that Sir Edward decides the time has come to build a castle of his own. What with the French and the peasants, these are dangerous times. He's also a very ambitious man, and there's nothing better than a castle to remind friends, neighbours and enemies just how big a fish you are. But not just anybody can build a castle. First, you have to have the king's permission. Fortunately, Sir Edward has friends at court, and in 1385, King Richard grants his request. In the words of the day, he is licensed to fortify and crenellate his manor house. To crenellate means to add the main feature we associate with castles, the battlements. But this is not what Edward does. Instead, he decides to build a castle from scratch further down the hill from his manor house, nearer to the river. The castle Dallingridge builds is the castle of the city today. It is from the outside massive gatehouse, all rising out of the centre of a wide, deep moat. But Dallingridge wanted more than just a castle. He wanted all the appearances of a landed aristocrat. He wanted an estate. So he landscaped the whole area, creating new ponds around the castle, diverting the river, 
creating a mill pond and mill next to the harbour. It must have been a pretty impressive sight. It has been debated just how serious the castle's defences really were. But any attacker would certainly have thought twice about tacking. The moat, along with all the other water features, would have made it hard for them to get close in strength, which might have forced them to try a direct assault on the castle's main entrance, which would not have been easy, since Bodium had all the most fashionable defensive features of its day. They'd first have to advance along the causeway, which was then parallel to the castle, under fire from the castle's defenders every step of the way. Then they'd have come up against the Barbican, a sort of mini outer castle, which would have been strongly guarded. Finally, they'd have faced the toughest challenge of all, the Great Gatehouse. This bristled with nasty surprises. First, they'd have to break through the portcullis, above which is a massive parapet with large holes, called machicolations, through which the defenders would have poured boiling tar. And even if they had managed to force their way in, they'd have been attacked again from above by stones, and more boiling tar dropped through these murder holes. Lucky for Bodium, and for Sir Edward and Lady Dallingridge, none of this ever actually happened. The castle was never besieged in their day. Some people argue that the defences were more for show, and they may have a point because Bodium was also something else for Edward and his wife. A home. They had been used to the comforts of a manor house, and they weren't going to give these up just because their home was now a castle. So while it looks tough outside, it was quite the opposite inside. Imagine that these walls, now rough and ruined, were once smooth, newly quarried sandstone. Imagine that instead of empty arches, there were shuttered windows and doors made of English oak. Imagine the Great Hall, where Edward and Elizabeth, seated at the high table, would have taken their meals together with the castle's household. Imagine servants bustling through from the kitchen, where two great fireplaces burned all day, winter and summer. Imagine the Lord's Chamber, where Dalling Ridge would have greeted guests and carried out the business of his estate. From here, Edward and Elizabeth would have retired to the bedchamber, or attended services in the castle's chapel, looking down from their own private balcony. place to live, with all the creature comforts that are not to the minute medieval couple would want. But hardly had his new castle been built, when Dallingridge was off to France again to captain the French port of Brest. Three or four years later, he died, aged about fifty. Like so many knights and nobles of his day, he had spent the best part of 15 years of his life in action in France. Dallingridge was certainly Bodium's most important earner, but the story of the castle doesn't end there. For the next 250 years, it will be on one side or the other of the various power struggles that took place in England. During the Wars of the Roses, its owners were on the Lancastrian side, which made them enemies of King Richard III. He gave orders to besiege Bodium, but the castle very sensibly surrendered. Later, after the king himself was killed at the Battle of Bosworth, they moved back in. But it was during the English Civil War, which started in 1642, that Bodium would meet its fate. The castle's interior may have been 
been plundered and destroyed by the forces of Parliament, but in any case, by the late 1600s, it had fallen into ruin. Far from being the end of the castle, this marked a strange new beginning. Though ruined inside, Bodium was still one of the most magnificent castles to be seen anywhere. It has always been everyone's idea of the romantic medieval castle. From this point on, each of the castle's owners set out to preserve as much of Bodium as they could. Then, a new invader entered the valley, the Steam Railway. It brought agricultural workers to pick beer hops, and it brought even more visitors to see Bodium for themselves. Perhaps the most well-known owner of Bodium was Lord Curzon, famous for restoring and preserving major monuments. He fell in love with Bodium, and in 1917, he bought it. He began a process of conservation which continues today because on his death, he left Bodium to the National Trust. Time and wars move on. While Bodium might have put up a good defense in medieval times, it would have been useless against the planes, tanks, and artillery of 20th century warfare. Which is why, during the last World War, a new kind of defense was built here. The pillbox. Bodium's pillbox was part of a chain of strategic defenses built to guard vulnerable parts of the country against invasion. This time, by Germany. Once again, the invasion never came.